Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Hallelujah. God's so good. God is so good. Do you love Jesus today? Isn't it good to be around a lot of people who love Jesus like you do? I'm so glad. He's so good. Oh, how things are happening all around this world. Jesus said in the end times, men's hearts would fail them for fear of what was coming and what was already here. But I want you to know today that you don't have to be afraid of God. I've never preached a message like this. It's entitled, Scared of God? Question mark. Scared of God? Seems kind of unusual to preach something like this, but I want to really clarify what the Word of God means when it speaks of fearing the Lord and the different perspectives that righteous Christians and sinful people of the world would have of that. I'm not a fan of horror films. Some of you may really enjoy them. Since I was a child, I, I've only seen maybe four or five horror films up till now. And the ones that I saw, I still can see in my brain. And I didn't like it because they stayed with me. It caused fear in me. I was just programmed that way where I, I was fearful. I was a little wimpy child, a little scaredy cat. I don't know why, but I was. And God had to give me the victory over that. And I'm so glad that he can. It's so funny. I come in here sometimes, and um, I'll walk in, and there's nobody here, and all the lights are out, and it's just as calm. Whether I'm here at home, it doesn't bother me. But I remember a day when I was very young, I'd walk into a church when my dad would pastor, and I'd, I'd, I'd just be like, oh, man, if the lights are off, if the sun's not shining, because we had windows back then. Anybody remember windows in churches? The old-time churches, you'd have the big windows. And during the daytime, I was okay. I could go and I'd play. See, his pastor, pastor's children have perks. You get to go play in the church <laughs> when your dad's a pastor and you live in a parsonage behind the church. So uh, I enjoyed those days. I'd get up there when nobody could see me and grab a microphone. And power was off. Uh, PA system was off. But I'd just go to preaching a strip like my dad. And uh, just a little boy and thought it was a lot of fun. Get on the instruments, play the drums a little bit. <clears throat> They'd always come in, who's, been, who's messed with the drums? Who knows? <laughs> Probably the preacher's kids. But I remember a lot of things. But one of the things that uh, really had a hold on me for a long time was fear. Uh, it, it was just uh, imaginations, things that were never going to happen, but I was scared. I also remember being so fearful when we went to uh, department stores, and if I were to be left in a toy department and my parents were just two aisles over, I would almost go into a panic because I thought they've left me. And I, I, again, I don't know why. My mom said that when I was uh, around four years old at a particular church, a uh, matter of fact, it was Halton, that some of those sweet children, and I do, I loved them. I love the kids, but I, I've at least got to tell on them. I'm not going to say their names. But some of those sweet children locked me in a Sunday school room at nighttime, and it was dark, and I couldn't get out, and I screamed and screamed and screamed. And my mother said she thinks that had an impact on me, that uh, <laughs> a negative impact that it might have messed me up a little bit psychologically. So it took a while for me to get over that. We may, and I'm not in this category, but you may enjoy watching scary movies to get a, a thrill, but most of us don't like to live out those moments. We don't want to be in those moments where that it seems some man is stalking you at night in a parking lot and, or, or someone's got a gun and they're bursting into a store that you're in and you're having to dive down. You know, It might be exciting to watch it, but it's horrible to ever be in those situations. And so I want to look today about the, the topic of fear and then versus fearing the Lord. 17 scriptures in the Word of God speak of fearing God. There are also 35 times in the Bible where it speaks of fearing the Lord. And so we need to understand what that actually means. We're going to get into that. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, Proverbs chapter 9. Verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So right off the bat here, we're, th we're thinking, well, Pastor, does that mean I'm supposed to be scared of God in order to be wise? So if we want to really understand the meaning of the word fear, in our modern day time, it would be more like reverence, uh, that we adhere to his principles. We are concerned about pleasing him. And it is our desire to do right. 
uh, we are fearful that we might displease the Lord. And we're going to get deeper into this in a moment, but I want to jump into Exodus chapter 20 and show you a moment where people were scared of God. The Israelites had been traveling through the wilderness on foot, some in wagons, and I'm sure they had some animals. They would set up uh, a tents. Uh, there was a lot going on. There were times where they got a little hungry and God would send quail for them to have meat. You probably remember the story of manna. That was like huddle house waffles falling from the sky. And every morning it was enough to feed them. And then he said on that, that Friday, because Saturday was the Sabbath, on Friday gather two quantities of what you need because the next day there will be no manna falling. There will, the huddle house in heaven's closed. <clears throat> on Saturday. So there'll be no manna falling from the sky. Of course, the main part of our story I want to show with you is that these people were absolutely dependent upon God. So their view of God should be that he is my provider. But yet, let's look at Exodus 20, verses 18 through 21. Now, all the people witnessed the thunderings. Now, this is a moment where Moses has gone up on Mount Sinai, and the glory of God is putting on such a magnificent show that this is what is being seen. There were thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. Now, if you don't think God can put on a big show, you look at that scripture. God had come down to the mountain, and his glory was so powerful. There were thunderings. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but sometimes thunder can get so loud that it shakes the ground, and it makes me a little nervous. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Uh, uh, there's been times I see lightning bolts coming out of the sky and hitting it looks like about a quarter mile away from me, and I get a little nervous. But imagine you're at the foot of a mountain, and you're right there within hundreds of feet, and you can see the th hear the thunder, see the lightning, see the thick cloud, and even hear a sound of a trumpet coming from the top of the mountain. That would cause you to fear, possibly. Then they said... Let's go back on the end of verse 18. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak to us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. God can appear to be scary, but you need to understand who he really is in order not to fear him in the wrong way. We go back just a few days, weeks, maybe months from this story, and we find that there was another situation where that God unleashed ten plagues upon the nation of Egypt. You remember that story? There were flies, frogs, darkness, water turned to blood. You know, they talk about when the hurricanes hit, like in Houston and coming through Florida, they're concerned about the um, supply of water, you know, much less gas. We're just talking about water and how that it becomes so easily polluted because of the oceans coming onto shore and, and getting into the uh, sewer systems and water supplies. But these people were in a desert and were concerned uh, well, this was time of Egypt. They lived in a, a small oasis surrounded by desert, and if their water was cut off, such as the Nile River, they were going to die. And all these things took place, and the Israelites saw the hand of God as he brought these ten plagues. The, the Egyptians had a reason to be afraid of God. Think about the Tower of Babel. You remember that story. They were building it in, in defiance of God, saying that mankind is equal or greater than God. We'll make a name for ourselves over all the earth. We'll build a tower all the way to heaven. And what did God do? He came down and confused their languages. And that's why we have Spanish and English and French and Russian and German and all other types of languages, because God broke up their ungodly plans. And they learned to fear the Lord. When the people of Sodom and Gomorrah became so depraved and, and we even hear of homosexual activity and desires among them and how they tried to beat down the door of Lot and his family so they could get to the two angels who the Sodomites thought were men in order to have relations with them of a sexual nature, which was detestable. And so what did God do? He blinded those who were trying to attack the Lot and his family and the angels. They got out and God rained down fire and brimstone. The Sodomites and the Gomorites had a reason to fear and be afraid of God. In the New Testament, when Ananias and Sapphira, 
at different times within a few minutes of each other, came in to the disciples and said, we have sold all that we have. We're giving everything to the ministry and to the poor. And Peter spoke up and said, you've lied to me. You've lied to the Holy Ghost. And Ananias dropped dead right there in front of him. He, Peter had men to carry Ananias out to bury him. The wife comes in not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her the same thing. What is this money you've brought? She says, we've sold everything. We've given everything we have to the ministry, to the poor. He said, you've lied to me in the Holy Ghost. She dropped dead right there. That's New Testament time period. Ananias and Sapphira had a reason to be afraid of God. But as saints and children of God, if you are walking in the light, walking according to the word, you have absolutely no reason to ever be afraid of God. The fear of the Lord that is spoken of in Proverbs is speaking of reverence. Reverence. I want to talk to you for a moment about the superiority of our God, that it is unquestionable. Although we do not have to be afraid, we need to reverence him because of his superiority. Genesis 1, verses 14 through 18, which is not on the screen, spoke that the sun, moon, and stars were created because God just said for it to happen. Now, that's authority. That's power. Next scripture on the screen, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. It reads, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I don't know if I shared this a week ago or not, so if I'm repeating myself, forgive me, but let me tell you again, that when I pray, I have found that it is so amazing how my prayer shifts as soon as I start telling God who he is. When I start saying, my God, you're the Alpha, and you're, oh, I feel him right now, Brandon. You're the Alpha, you're the Omega, you're the beginning and the end. It's not when I'm saying, God, I speak this over my family, and God, I pray this over America. Those are awesome times. But when I really get deep in prayer, it's when I start telling Jesus, you are the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the way maker. You're the peace speaker. You're the door. You are the everlasting. Father, you are Prince of Peace. God, you're my counselor. You're wonderful. You're perfect. And when you talk to God and tell him who he is, your prayer life will take a whole nother level from what you've ever been on in, in your life. God is wanting us to understand who he is when we approach him. I've also found, Sister Laura, that it's a lot less likely that I will be distracted when I pray when I'm thinking of how great he is. When I remind myself as I enter a, a, a time period of prayer that he is not just somebody who is a mentor. He's not a teacher or a preacher only, but he is God, Brother Randall. He's the one who spoke us into existence. If not for him, there would not only be an, no way of salvation, there would be no earth. There would be no life. No light or darkness, but because of our God and his goodness, gentleness, and mercy. We exist today, and not only do we exist like the dog that runs around in your house or the cat that's in your yard or a horse or, or some other animal you may have, but you exist with a greater purpose. Why? Because, Sister Hope, you were created in the image of God. I know your dog and your cat are special to you, but I'm here to tell you you're greater than your dog or your cat or your animal. You are made in the image image of God and so when you enter the prayer room you get along with Jesus you start understanding God I've got a purpose and my purpose is not to float along and just be a good person my purpose is to storm the gates of hell my purpose is to declare things of you that have not come to pass yet and rebuke the enemy and speak blessings and speak hope and joy and declare righteousness unto this lost world my purpose and your purpose is to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who do not know him you've got a purpose and when you find out who God is it helps you to stay focused on that purpose and to stay focused on your prayer time. We find out in another scripture, Mark 10, 27, it won't be on the screen either, but it tells us with God, nothing is impossible. They were talking about concern in Miami of the skyscrapers being possibly all the windows blown out because of Hurricane Irma. They said that there are huge cranes and uh, spread throughout Miami, and they're concerned about them falling in the catastrophic destruction that could happen because of that. But I serve a God, Brother Ricky, that can scale any skyscraper. 
I've got a God who can climb Mount Everest and 15 billion mountains taller than it if he wanted to. I've got a God, Sister Rachel, who can solve every algebraic equation you could throw at him because he's the one who came up with them anyway. I've got a God, Sister India, that can hit the highest pitch note off the piano and hit the lowest note that can't even be heard. Our God is capable and able to do all things. He can do the impossible. May I, I tell you today, look, look at your neighbor. I want you to help me. Look at your neighbor and say, whatever you're facing with God, it's possible. Woo, Lord Jesus, bro, I'm telling you right now. Whatever you're facing with God, it's possible. Do you believe that today? Woo, my Lord. Whatever you face, tell somebody else. I just feel this. Look at somebody else right now. Find somebody. Go ahead and get, get focused. Get the target on them. Say, whatever you're facing with God, woo, it's possible. <laughs> woo, my Lord Jesus. Front, everybody, now, Brother Jim, if you can't do it, fine, but, or Sister Deborah, but everybody that can on the front two rows, stand up. Turn around, face the back. Point at them with your finger and say, whatever you're facing with God, it's possible. Now, don't sit down yet. Everybody else, stand up. You're going to point back. Everybody else. Now, front, front two rows, y'all stand there and take it. All right, back rows. Tell them, whatever you're facing with God, Ooh, it's possible. Give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. Woo, my Lord Jesus. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you for helping me. Our God is an unstoppable God. Uh, isn't it interesting what a difference it makes when you're praying and you realize what you just said? That God with you. My Lord, I feel him today, Brother Richard Jeffers. Everything is possible. With God, nothing is impossible. Listen to what Job said about him. Boy, this will get your motor cranked. Job chapter 9, verses 5 through 8. He removes the mountains, and they do not know when he overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth out of its place, and its pillars tremble. He commands the sun, and it does not rise. He seals off the stars. He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. And if you want to get just a little bit nervous, Katie, you probably don't, but I'm just going to read it anyway. If you want to get a little bit nervous, you go to Hebrews chapter 10 and you read verses 30 and 31. And it says, For we know him, speaking of God, who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To the unrighteous person, it is very scary to fall into the hands of a living God. But I want to explain to you today why as a Christian you don't have to be afraid of God because he's your father. John chapter 3. It's a good scripture right here, bro. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life God showed us one of the greatest acts of love that could ever be shown by doing what was said in the scripture he loved you so much he sent his only son to die in your place and my place so that we could have everlasting life Colton I'm going to give you a good word right here some of you say oh Colton's getting singled out I'm going to give you a good word. No matter where you go, no matter where you preach, no matter where you teach, no matter how many countries you travel to, always preach Christ and Him crucified. That word right there will set captives free. People will be saved when they hear that message that God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, Brother Jim, me and you, our middle name is whosoever, believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You don't have to be afraid of a God who would do that. As a child of his, you don't have to be afraid of him. Jesus stepped in between us and the judgment of God. God did not boast in the fact that he was going to have to judge sin. He didn't sit on a throne and say, I can't wait till they die because I want to show them how big I am and how little human, uh, human beings are. I'm going to sentence them all to punishment. That wasn't the heart of God. Matter of fact, he proved it wasn't when he sent Jesus. And he said, I'm going to do everything I can to rescue you from a place called hell. I'm going to rescue you from an eternity separated from me by sending my most precious 
treasure my own son. And God did that. And why did he do it? He did it because he loved you. Some people may still be worried, along with Katie, of Hebrews 10, 31, about a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But I want to make sure you understand who he was talking about. Katie, we're going, we're going to handle that right here. You ready? It was found in verse 29. Listen to who he was talking about. Those who has, have trampled the Son of God underfoot counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Now, you've not done that. You've not trampled the name of Jesus or, or trampled Jesus or stepped in his blood and said, I, I reject it. You've not done that. So you don't have to worry about falling into the hands of a fearful God. As long as you just live for the Lord, then God's going to bless you. So understand something. You don't have to be afraid because of that scripture in Hebrews because he's speaking of people who have rejected Jesus and insulted the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Look at your neighbor and say, that sure was good news. <laughs> it really was. Did you say it, Crystal? No, look, I'm looking. I, there's two crystals. Did y'all say it, Crystal's Crystal's? Crystal's Burgers? All right, let me hear it. What did I tell you to say? I, look, I done got distracted. That was God. That, yes, that sure was good news. Now, let's hear it. Oh, come on. Y'all give them a hand. Woo! Isn't it great to go to a small church? You don't get this at 300-member churches sometimes. You know what I'm saying? It's, we have fun, don't we? That sure is good news. It's never been God's intention for us to be afraid of him. Go to the next scripture, Harry. You're doing a great job back there. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. For God has not, we understand that word, right? In the 90s, we used to say it without anything else. That doesn't make a sentence. But in the 90s, we thought not was a sentence. Because people would say stuff like, man, this teacher sure is a great history teacher. And then somebody in the room would go, not. <laughs> man, your dad sure is a good driver. Not. Isn't that funny? We made our own sentence out of one word. I don't think they ever changed the dictionary to accommodate that, but that's okay. Because God used it a long time ago. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. But guess what he gave you, Brother Neil? Woo! Mm, you better watch out. That Jeffers clan of, oh, there's three of them. Laura, Richard, Trisha, you Jeffers. Oh, there's them. Uh, Y'all better watch it. You ready? He gave you power and love and a sound mind. Next time you say, I'm going crazy, say, wait a minute, that ain't what Jesus said. Next time your spouse says, you just plump crazy. Say, that isn't what Jesus said. Jesus said, I got me a sound mind. Hallelujah. He didn't give you the spirit of fear. If you're afraid, if you're fearful of walking in a dark church because you're afraid you're going to see the ghost of dead uh, choir members on the walls, don't worry. Don't be afraid. If you're afraid of walking through cemeteries because your granddaddy might get up and take a hickory switch because of the words that come out of your mouth two months ago, don't worry. They're not coming back. Hopefully they're all in heaven. Understand this, that God didn't give you, did not give you a spirit of fear, Amen. but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. That is not just speaking about being afraid of ghosts and being afraid of the boogeyman hop, uh, crawling out from under your bed or your closet. And some of you just said, Pastor, don't say that. Because some of you had issues with that. It's not just talking about that. It's also speaking about being afraid you're not going to be able to pay your bills and your power's going to get cut off. Being afraid that your uh, husband or wife's going to leave you, find somebody else they care about more. You're afraid that maybe you'll try to do something. You'll set your mind to accomplish a goal and it's going to fall through and people make fun of you and say, well, I knew all along he was going to be a failure or she never could pull that off. Fear will cause you to freeze up on your potential. Can I get an amen? It'll cause you to shut down on doing things that God put inside you 
you to do. I'm talking to somebody this morning, Brother Ben. I believe God's Spirit is taking over, and he is, he is emphasizing this part because he wants you to know if you're afraid of carrying out something that he's put inside you, some of you might want to open up an animal clinic and be a veterinarian one day, and, and everybody says, well, that just costs too much money, and you got to get educated, and you, you have to have uh, people to help you, to work with you. You know what? If, if that's a goal in your heart, then tell God, Lord Jesus, I want to do it to glorify you. I want to open up an animal clinic because I want to show compassion to little puppies and kittens and animals, and I just want to love on them. You might not, 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 uh, not my, I might not, there it is, not. You might not be preaching to millions of people in Africa, but you're showing kindness to little puppies and little kittens. In God's eyes, do you know that's an awesome thing? And, and as you do that, you, I don't know why I'm talking about a veterinarian, but when the customers come in, those are human beings with a soul, and you may be planting seeds in their hearts. Every time. May not be preaching at uh, Nashville, Tennessee on a huge stage with 15,000 people, but you're planting seeds in those customers that come in with a little pet. Think about it. When God puts things in your heart, don't let fear shut you down from accomplishing your goals. Anybody thankful for just a good old solid word? Woo! Hallelujah! God wants us to destroy the power of fear. Now, this is where it's really going to hit home. I once was a child. Now, the sentence, not, wouldn't fit there. I was. You once were children. And most of us, see, I always have to understand there's, there's exceptions. But most of us would have lived in a home with a, a parent. Most of us. And we understood the difference between being afraid of our parents and reverencing our parents. Let me explain that. When my dad came at me with a belt or a hickory, come on, Colton. When he came after me, I was afraid of the pain that was heading toward my way. But, but listen, but I wasn't afraid of the man who was going to have to issue the punishment. Now, I didn't like him at that moment. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Love you, Dad. <laughs> no! No. I was probably a little ill at the moment and, and wishing I could negotiate. But I didn't fear the man. I'm going to tell you why I didn't fear the man because that man made sure I had a bed to sleep in. He bought my clothes. He and, and, and my mother provided for me, cooked meals, made sure I got to school so I could be educated. They took me to church. And beyond meeting basic needs, they loved me. And I saw it. I felt it. I heard it in their voices when they weren't whipping me. <laughs> I heard, I love you, son. And I knew it was true. I was afraid of the punishment, but I didn't fear the man or the woman in general, the, the dad or mother, because I understood there was a separation between me having to receive punishment and the love that they had for me as far as my perspective. And so God helped me, and I'm sure he did many of you over the years as you grew up and your parents whipped you less, <laughs> hopefully. Some of you might get a whipping next week. You better watch it. And I, as they whipped you less, I'm sure you started understanding more where they came from. And then it really hit home when you had your own kids. Can I get an amen? amen. And you were like, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Too bad that's not on camera. Uh, when we issue punishment, we start understanding what our parents felt when they were dealing with us. And it wasn't easy. It's not easy today as you punish children or, or you know, discipline them. And, and there's different ways. It's not, it doesn't always have to be a belt or a hickory. Sometimes you set them down and we can go on and on. <laughs> Get in the corner. Quote the 23rd Psalm 18,000 times. <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> I mean, can't you hear them on like 17,953? The Lord is my shepherd. That'd be pretty rough. When we view the Heavenly Father, God never wants us to be afraid of wrath coming down, just smoking us, torching us, causing us to become ashes. And you know why? Because he's proven far too many times that he loves you too much for that. You don't have to be afraid that God's punishing you, trying to destroy your life because you sinned last week. Now, is God happy if we sin last week? No, he is not, and he expects you to repent and stop doing it. Can I get an amen? But he doesn't come after us with a lightning bolt just because you blow it and say, Boy, I've been waiting on that. I want to wipe you out. If he was that way, we would be afraid of him, but he's not. 
He loves us so much that the first thing he does is something called conviction. The Holy Ghost starts moving and saying, you knew you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have said that. Why don't you turn direction? Why don't you ask me to, to make you clean of that, to forgive you of that? And let's get on the right path. That's how God deals with us, Randall. He says, I want to I make you better. I don't want to beat you into submission to where you just beg me to forgive you so you can barely scrape into heaven. No, I want you to understand that I love you all the way and that as long as you'll just serve me, I'm going to help you. Every day when you struggle, I'm going to help you. That's the way a father is. I'm so thankful my dad was not always looking for a reason to kick me out of my house. Can you imagine that? Eight years old, maybe I, I, I kicked my sister in the shin or something because she got on my nerves aggravating me again for the 1,876,000th time. You're out of the house, son. Hate your guts. Can you imagine that? I knew he'd never do that. And I can promise you, your heavenly father never will either. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to force you to serve him the rest of your life, but he certainly won't kick you out of the family and say, I can't stand you, I, I, I want to destroy you. No, 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 no. How could we ever think that of a God who is so loving that he had sent his own son to die for our sins? Amen. That's good news, isn't it? Yeah. You don't have to be afraid of a God who loves you that much. You might not enjoy it when God chastens you, because he does. He chastens those he loves. Yeah. Harry, that's one of the big words, chasten. That means he disciplines. He disciplines us. As we conclude today, I know we're winding down. I want to share something with you. Then I need your help with uh, reading some scripture. I'm just going to walk around the room and let you read it off the screen. Somebody just got nervous. <laughs> I had a thought the other day. I was in the restroom. I believe I was shaving or brushing my teeth. I was standing there looking in the mirror, and a thought came to my mind. How many of you ever think in the restroom? Because if you don't think, man, you may come out with half a shaved face. You better think. I was standing there, and I've got a 14-year-old still in the house. Of course, a 22-year-old is already out of the house now on her own. I've got a 14-year-old and a 7-year-old. And this is what thought came to my mind, Brother Jim. <laughs> I thought as long as they're in my house, under my care, they will know that they are loved, okay? Now, that doesn't mean they'll always agree, such as a requirement by 1030, you know, Chloe at her age, by 1030 she cannot be on her phone. Now, with Roxy Jane, of course, we don't have to worry about her getting on the phone, but she has to be in bed earlier than Chloe. But whatever the rule is, based on their age, they might not always like it, but they know something, that they are loved, and it, the thought came to my mind that once they leave my house and they go out into the world, whether they're, they're married or move off to a college, and they start dealing with professors and teachers and, and employees, people who they're not related to, who aren't mom and daddy, that they will quickly realize a difference between those people and what they have in the house. Because those folks sometimes will try to use them. Sometimes. Now, not everybody's bad, but, but you have to keep your guard up for people outside the home that will try to manipulate you. Sometimes when you get a new job, people will t that, that work there will tell you things that aren't true to get you in trouble. You ever had that happen? I know it happens at school for sure. You go to a new school and kids are telling you all kind of crazy stuff. Yeah, after break, you get a 30-minute extension. You're like, okay. Hanging out around the, the gym and the, you come and say, get to the principal's, principal's office. You're supposed to be in class. You know, all kind of crazy stuff. You find out quickly that people outside the home, for the most part, do not treat you the same way as mama and daddy because they just don't quite have the same love for you the way that your parents do. Your parents want to see you accomplish the most possible. They want to see you become great. And a lot of times the world seems to think the opposite. They want you to be great as long as it helps them. And that happens many times. And this is what come to my mind that the more that we experience life as Christians, we realize how much our God really loves us. As we step out of this building, we go about our, our lives, separate lives. We find out so quickly that everybody doesn't think the way our Father thinks. That everyone doesn't love us the way our Heavenly Father loves us. And because of this, <clears throat> we need to learn that we don't have to fear someone who has our best interest at heart. I don't have to be afraid of someone who's made plans for me to be successful. Because that's just what a parent does. And that's what God's done for you. 
So I'm going to step out into the congregation now because I want to read or have you to read several scriptures. Talk about the promises of God and what he has available to us. And I'll start over here with Brother Ricky. Go ahead, uh, Harry, put up that next slide. Let's see what it says. If you will, read the whole scripture on that screen. Psalm 27, 1 and 2. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Isn't that good? Who in the world should I ever be afraid of? God is on our side. Amen. Sister Deanna. Psalm 86, verse 15. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. <laughs> I like that word full. If I'm heading out of state, I want my gas tank to be on full, Richard. I don't want a quarter of a tank. Say, Lord, help me get there. I like to be full and prepared. The Bible says that our God is full of compassion. Amen. Long-suffering. Hope, would you read Romans 5, verses 8 and 9? But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Is everybody clear on that last part? He said you were justified by his blood, so guess what happens? You are saved from his wrath. <laughs> oh, thank the Lord. And that's good stuff right there. Oh, Tricia, look at you. Is the Lord just blessing you over there, sister? Hallelujah. Let's go to Psalm 103, verse 8, and just preach a minute. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and an abundance of mercy. Isn't that something? He's merciful, he's gracious. He doesn't get mad easily. Have y'all ever been in a frame of mind where you just got mad way too quick? I think most of us have. And you regret it later. Your God never does that. He's not easily angered. Oh, we got another one up there. Hallelujah. Who else wants to read that? John, Romans 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage against the to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption from whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I think most of you know what Abba means. I'll tell you if you don't, it means daddy. A modern translation of Abba, Abba, is daddy. First John 3 and 1. So how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. Oh, glory. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children. And why is that? Well, it's because they don't know Him. But we can do something about that, can't we? <laughs> we can tell them. I got one more scripture, then we're going to dismiss. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Remember, as you pray, as you live every day of your life, if you'll keep in mind who God is and what He's capable of, it'll change your life. Amen. Ooh, here we go. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly. All right, we're going to have to read this together. Do we just going to have to do it? It's too good. It's too good to just let the pastor read it. As you speak it out loud, your faith is about to grow. Are you ready? Read it with me. I'll go slow. Now to him who is able ooh, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. My Lord, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Stand with me. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, give the Lord a hand. Praise the Lord. He's able. He is able. To fear the Lord is to reverence and respect Him, but as His child, you never have to fear Him. You never have to be afraid. He's so good. We're going to pray, and let me quickly say that tonight I've got a burning hot coal of word God's put in me about when the rocks cry out, and uh, it's going to be something that you've never heard in your life. Uh, God gave it fresh to me, and it's just so powerful, and, and it has to do with you. So if you're able, please be here. Because I don't want a stone or a rock to cry out in my place. Amen. Let's pray.
Most Heavenly Father, I'm so glad that when I pray, I can say those words. Heavenly Father, I am glad that you chose to be more than just a God, which a God's enough. But Lord, it means so much more to us that you are Father. You're my daddy, you're Abba. Lord, thank you that through Jesus Christ, we have that relationship. I pray today that, God, you would help your people to, not to fear even what's coming upon the earth, but to know that greater are you in us than he that's in this world. Lord, you've given us power, love, and a sound mind, and I pray that we'll grab hold of those things and no longer be anxious, depressed, worried, uh, scared. But, God, we'll just walk in faith and say, you know, God's always handled it in the past. You'll handle it now. I thank you for being so good. We love you. We bless your holy name. Bring us back safely tonight. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Look forward to seeing you tonight.